Elaine. Hey, Brooke, how are you? I'm doing well today. How are you? Doing good, thanks. Yeah, I was just, just saying how it, we've had our first big, big snowstorm here. We've had a couple of smaller ones. We've had a big, you know, six inch or so and that's in Utah, but you were saying you live in Sacramento. Do you get a lot of snow there? We don't get snow. I think the last time there was snow in Sacramento was in 1979 or something. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the good thing is we see it. We see it on the Sierra, like 100 miles away. So we see all of these white mountains in the distance, which is beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's always fun to see snow until you're in it and you're cold. But exactly. <laughs> it, is, it is really pretty. I agree. So... Well, okay. So yeah, we're kind of getting to the end of the the year. And I think, you know, it's tradition for people to talk about New Year's resolutions. Is that something that you do yourself or not so much? Um, not really. I used to, but I'm, I guess I'm more focused on goals than resolutions. So, you know, okay. planning for next year, what do I want to do? Sometimes stop doing and, and those sort of things. So it's more goals than resolutions, right. really. Right. So what are some of your goals? And these could be angular goals, professional goals. They could be personal goals, whatever you want. So I have one pretty interesting goal that's that's 100% angular. And it's that in 2023, I want to start a daily newsletter. Um, So sending an email every day to my subscribers so they learn one small tip and trick around angular. Um, so it's going to be a lot of work because, yeah. you know, once a day is, is a commitment, <laughs> a lot. Yeah. five days per week, not, not seven days though, just work okay. days, okay. uh, all year long. So that's something I want to launch for the first time. Never tried that before. And I think it can be a pretty good format for people to, you know, just pick one tiny little thing per day yeah. on the Angular framework. Yeah. Well, sign me up. Seriously. Because, <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> well, yeah, really though. I think that, you know, sometimes people underestimate the power of just little bits and pieces mm-hmm. added up over time. You know, it yeah. may not seem like a whole exactly. lot today, but after a week, after a month, it really adds up. So I think it's a great idea. And what a benefit to you as well, because you are the one that has to do all that writing. So exactly. So I have to be looking for new ideas, yeah. things to share and and, and yeah, always be on my toes to 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 make sure I can cover the entire year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. Great, great goal. Thank you. So, yeah, and I will literally, I will go sign up. So, yeah, but I'm really excited for today's episode because we're going to talk about your website, your consulting company called Angular Training. Mm-hmm. And I always think of like somebody working out, like exercising training. I don't know if that was the idea behind. <laughs> why you named it that way but it it is fitting i think because it is like you know building those angular muscles mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's what we're we're going to talk about that um but really hit it heavy with like angular specific learning we were just talking a minute ago how you know this roadmap to learning angular series is one where i do really want to bring in different developers stories and learn from their experience and their tips and suggestions on what's worked for them as far as learning angular goes but i haven't really had an episode yet where it's just heavy hitting into like like diving deep into learning angular itself mm-hmm. and that is where i just think you're the perfect person for this conversation really getting into that because you've done a lot of consulting and teaching And I think you have a lot of really good insights that we will be able to really benefit from. So I'm really excited to have you here. So thank you. You're welcome. Happy to be here too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I always like to start with a a bit of a game before we get into it. I just think it's fun for people to get to know who are these people that are on, on the camera a little bit more than just who we are as developers. So this actually comes from a local Utah radio station. And it's a fun game that the morning show plays that they call things that must go. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We're just going to share one or two things that maybe we don't really fully understand why other people are really into or things that are just like pet peeves to us, but something that just, we want to just go. So do you have anything in mind, things that must go? So one thing I I had in mind was 
social media <laughs> okay. to some extent, meaning that it seems that these days, if anyone says anything online, it becomes like, you know, a war and people are going to say, oh, no, you cannot say this, you cannot say that. Everything gets right. polarized very quickly. Right. And it's, I mean, it's just not good. <laughs> it's really so bad. Like, you, you cannot say anything anymore and everybody gets angry about it. So if this yeah. could change, I would be super happy for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and it's not actually on it's not too unlike the one I was going to share because the one that I find just intrusive is when let's say you've been out shopping somewhere and then mm -hmm. you come home and not two minutes later, all of the ads oh, on yeah. your computer are for wherever you just were or whatever you just bought. And it, I know that you can go onto your cell phone and like turn those settings off, but I just find that so intrusive so there like yeah. that that things that must go that must go i agree too yeah oh. and the thing is even if you disable the ads i tried that once but the thing is the ads they would put to me at after that were almost more uh more of a problem than the ads oh. i would get before okay <laughs> meaning i would get ads for underwear and that kind of stuff i'm like i don't want to see that <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> i'd rather have yeah. you spy on me and put things that's somewhat relevant <laughs> yeah oh seriously no yeah no i i couldn't agree more so yeah that's my my thing that must go but well then let's just get into this i I really want to hear your story as well, because I know that you, although you're in California now, that's not where you're from, yep. but I even want to go back a little bit before then, um, get more of Alain's story and hear how you got into programming, how you became such an expert with Angular yourself, and then we'll start digging more into what you've seen with other people as they try to learn Angular, uh, you know, common barriers for them things that you've done to help them overcome that things like that so but let's do let's start with when when did you get into programming were you younger were you older how did that all come to be so i guess i was i was in high school it was one or two years before graduating high school and i basically got into programming by accident we had those uh, Texas instrument calculators, you know, yes. and you can basically code in it. And so I grew up in the 90s in France. Internet was barely starting at that point. I didn't have any computer at home. My parents were not at all into technology and stuff. So high school, I get that calculator, I start coding and I was like, oh, wow, this is so powerful. I can do so many things from scratch and, and build stuff. So I found that amazing. Yeah. And then I realized that that's basically how you, you, you create, you know, computer programs and everything. So I started learning online about coding other languages and such. And then when I went to college, I basically went all in for computer science and okay. uh, yeah, did all of my college education uh, related to coding and, uh, and working with computers so it okay. almost started by accident i would say yeah <laughs> it's not it's not uh, all that uncommon though you are not the first person who i've interviewed that actually said it was those texas instrument calculators that they mm -hmm. were playing around with and just yeah. got into it so that's that's amazing but let me ask this and this is something that comes from personal interest because i i was a teacher before and so i'm always curious what other countries do as far as teaching computer sciences for those primary grades so did you do, does france have a very robust you know kindergarten through 12th grade type program for learning coding or any computer not, sciences not not really not okay. and i so i'm not 100 percent up to date on that because i, I left france as uh, eight years ago now okay. um but basically when i graduated from high school there was zero computer science education okay from you know kindergarten to, to high school there was basically nothing meaning we didn't even learn the notion that coding existed yeah so that wow. was really if we went to a computer it was to learn the basics of you know, text editors and that, that kind of thing, but nothing okay. more than that. So, okay. 
So yeah, it was pretty much ground zero. Okay, well that's <laughs> from not- From an education standpoint. On computer science, on other stuff, it's pretty good, but computer science, not that much. Okay, yeah, and, and I don't I don't think America really has very robust system either for that. It's And it, it kind of gets pushed out, right? I mean, language arts and, and math take priority over computer science, which is good in many ways, <laughs> but I just think we need to bring more of the sciences and stuff in as well. Um, okay, so you're in France, you get into computer science, you go to college yeah. for that. Then how did you find your way over to the States? So after I graduated, I got a job in France. And after one year in that job, my company was looking for someone to go to the US. Okay. And nobody wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> because the thing is, everyone in the company was a little bit older. Let's say everyone was in their 30s or 40s or 50s. They had kids, family. So it's difficult to move everyone right. and, and you know change your life when, when you have, when you're settled really. Yeah. It was not my case. I just started my job. I was with my girlfriend. We didn't have any kids. So we had that freedom to yeah. just give it a shot. And so we said yes. And a few months later, so we had to get married in order to move to, okay. to the US. So it's really part of our family history now. Yeah. Um, and we moved next to Philadelphia. So it was on the East Coast. Okay. We did three years over there. And then we came back to France because it was a three year kind of contract visa that we okay. had. And when I came back to France, got an, a bunch of other jobs, but I was not really happy with the way my career went in France. Okay. Uh, I really enjoyed my time in the US because in the US, the culture is different when it comes down to work and people tend to get rewarded faster if they are doing well. Okay. Meaning, you know, if yeah, you, you're going to get a raise, you're going to get a better position, more responsibility, right. that kind of stuff. In France, it does happen, but a lot slower. You have to work for years and years and years before okay. hoping for something. Okay. So I really like the dynamic part of the, the job market in the US. And so, um, at some point, after three, four years in France, I thought, I, I cannot do this anymore. I, I think I, we have to go back to the US somehow. <laughs> and I started doing some freelancing on the okay. side. So I had my full time job. And on the side, I started doing some uh, coding. I was pretty good with Google Maps at that point. So I, I would be building maps or map based applications for, for my customers. And Pretty much at the same time, AngularJS came out. Okay. So as I started freelancing, I learned about AngularJS. I started using it for my clients and I just loved it because back then, you know, the competition was really jQuery <laughs> or just plain JavaScript, which was okay. very bad compared to what it is today. Right. So AngularJS was, oh, wow, it's such amazing two-way data bindings and change detection, all these things never happened before. So it was a huge revolution. And for me, it meant I could work with more clients because I would deliver faster than before. So I was able to do one, two, three, I don't know how many projects with Angular, but the boost in productivity made me a better freelancer as a result. Okay. And so we got to the point where 80% of my clients were either in the US or in Canada. And I was still in France, but nice. basically I had zero interest staying in France. I, I thought, why not move closer to my clients? Right. And since I had an experience on the East Coast before, well, this time we would go to the West Coast. And that's how we decided to move to California. Okay. Basically start a business in the US and, and keep doing this. So it all started with Angular, Google yeah. Maps. And, uh, and yeah, then basically starting the company in, in California. I love that. I love hearing everybody's particular reason for choosing Angular. I've had some some people say it was forms, mm -hmm. maps. This is the first time I've heard maps, but I love that. You know, and I think it goes to show just how much Angular really can do, right? So that that's super fun. So you're in California, but I well, let me ask this too, because you had already been programming. You knew you you knew your way around, you know, how to build things, but 
were there any things about Angular? And I know this was JS. I know it was different than what we're going to see now. But was there anything that you found particularly challenging yourself or anything that you came up across and you just went, what, you know, what is going on here? Um, with AngularJS, I think that the most difficult thing initially was to was to even believe that it works because it okay. was so different from everything else. Yeah. Like the two editor binding, it seemed like so much magic. Uh, and it was easy to to try to abuse it in many ways. <laughs> like, oh, okay, it's all gonna happen automatically and maybe it's even gonna trigger a request to the server automatically and such. So it was maybe trying to push the framework too much or to use some of these features too much okay. and not knowing where the the boundary was. Um, I think if, yeah, if I remember properly, the other challenge with AngularJS in the very first days was that the documentation for it was unit tests. Mm. So the website for AngularJS, the way to learn about all of these things uh, was through unit tests. So the examples were through unit tests, okay. which means if you didn't have a unit testing background, it would be pretty difficult to get right. into AngularJS. I was lucky to have that background, so it was kind of okay to to understand, get through the examples and everything. That I know that it was steep for other people who had no idea what this syntax was about. Right. Okay. So then, learning for you was very hands on with your clients' projects, exactly. things like that. Okay. Yeah. The thing is, because I had projects to work on, I mm -hmm. had a goal to reach. I had a deadline. So right. when you have these, you basically have to make things happen. And I could either go the old way with the JavaScript I already knew, or try to incorporate more Angular into it. Right. And as I got more confident, I would be building more and more with Angular JS okay. and basically learning little by little like this. Yeah. Okay. So then with that, eventually you created Angular training. So how did that come to be? So this came to be because once I moved to California, uh, I didn't know anyone here. I was really starting from scratch. Nobody right. knew about me getting in, in Sacramento uh, in 2014. And I thought the best way for me to learn about the local community is to go to meetups. Mm. So I started going to JavaScript meetups, Google developer groups, uh, front end meetups, anything that was somewhat related to what I was doing, okay. I would go there. And back then, 2014, every single meetup I went to, there would be a recruiter or two coming to pitch, oh, we're looking for five Angular people, we're looking for 10 Angular people, nice. we're looking for Angular, 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 Angular. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And uh, and because I had started from the very, very beginning with AngularJS, like when 1.0 was released, the very, very first version, I realized that my resume was basically standing out because okay. I had more experience than pretty much anybody else. I was right there from the very start. Nice. So I decided that I would be the Angular guy, basically. <laughs> I had that kind of advantage of having around since the very beginning. So yeah. I would keep doing that. And I created an Angular meetup in Sacramento. Okay. I would start going on stage, doing talks, which, by the way, is a great way to learn more about <laughs> anything, really. Yes. Agreed. Uh, and yeah, all of that, you know, one thing leading to another. Being in America, you get opportunities. People saw me talk and they started asking me, hey, do you want to publish content on Angular? Do you want to do a video course? Do you want to do live training? And well, I said yes to these opportunities, and it got me into doing training, doing conferences, more meetups, video courses. And at some point, I said, well, you know what? I do all of these things that, that are 100% Angular. So yeah. my company is going to be Angular training, and I'm going to teach people how to do that. That's going to be my main thing. Instead of just coding and building apps, I'm going to be training, teaching, mentoring people around Angular. Angular. Okay. So then do you go, you go into companies, do you train them how to uh, improve their code? Do you train them how to upgrade? What does that look like when you go into a, it, a company? It or can be you any of these scenarios. Okay. Most of the time what happens is that you have a company that has legacy code from 
10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Something that built with Java or .NET, and it's all server-side generated, and they just want to, to move to Angular or, or React, basically. They're going to choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when they move to Angular, they, they're going to look for some training. And that's where I come in to play. Typically, I would travel to that company. We would sit yeah. together for three, four, five days, depending on how much time they have. And we go through everything, but starting from scratch and little by little, adding more uh, topics and, and you know, working on exercises, making sure okay. they get familiar with, with everything. Okay. Uh, so then that that's perfect. It's a perfect segue because I really want to know when you've been working with your clients, be that an entire company or a team or individuals, what is it? And similar to what I've asked you, what is it though that you have found are the most difficult concepts for people to wrap their minds around or or just understand? So RxJS would be number one for okay. sure, because as soon as we get into observables, people start to panic a little bit. Um, so my training, the RxJS part, I changed it, I don't know how many times. Okay. <laughs> and it's it's still a, a work in progress, I would say. I still like to refine some things and change it, even though I've taught that class mm -hmm. hundreds of times, every time I find some you know, wording to, to change or yeah. explain differently, remove one word, replace it with another that maybe makes more sense or is more relatable to people. Okay. Um, yeah, RxJS, number one. Number two would be if people are too ambitious, like let's say we're going to do five days of training and we want to learn Redux and NGRx and state management and and they don't know the basics of JavaScript before day one. So that would okay. be way too much to cover, just even in five days. I mean, we could yeah. just lecture and, and do all of it, but then what do they get out of it, really? It would right. be just overwhelming. So managing people's expectations around Angular and, and going slowly okay. is also a difficult thing when doing training, because yeah. they say, hey, give, give it all to us. But that's not how teaching works, right? Take some time to get familiar with things, practice. And then once you're comfortable, you can go to the next step, basically. Right. Uh, but uh, some of these things don't happen overnight, especially yeah. observables, RxJS, operator subjects. It has to click before you can move on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear you say that because even, even the boot camp that I went to when I was learning just the the essentials you know basic mm -hmm. javascript and they started to introduce us to react and things but they moved so quickly and it was just so it was it was that you know people compare it to the fire hydrant that's just yeah. blasting oh, yeah. mm -hmm. water on you but i understand people wanting to hear it all and and get it all but really it it's counteractive right when yeah when you're over overloading yourself with so much information that none of it's really sticking. So super important concept. I, I think people need to remember that more, even when they're just going through videos on their own or reading a book by themselves, you know, mm -hmm. take it slow and really make sure you understand a concept before you move on. So absolutely. But I am curious what, what strategy or what do you feel like you do that helps people understand observables? Is there some magic, you know, like, I don't know, just teaching strategy that you've used, <laughs> that you found helps people really grasp observables? So th there was really two or three things that I try to do to help okay. with that. The first one is vocabulary. Okay. I try to not talk about streams, for instance. Because okay. the word stream, if you come from Java or Python or someplace else, it can mean a completely different thing. And it mm -hmm. seems like super complex, low level kind of thing. So it, it, it just scares people from the start. So I try to avoid that word. Okay. Um, and the second thing that I do is start with a very basic, concrete example of what you can do with an observable. So because Relating to what I struggled with in college, for instance, or even learning new technologies is people give you information, but if you don't see how you're going to use it, 
then it's a lot more difficult to understand. If you don't see what the actual use case for it, how yes. am I going to use this? You're talking about streams. I don't need streams. I just want to make a request to a server. So yeah, changing the vocabulary and giving a nice basic example of how to use it. So with observables, I like to show a form control, like a basic okay. drop down. You select a value, you subscribe to this, and you receive the selected value. That way, everyone can relate to it. It's easy enough. It's visual, doesn't involve the back end. Because the other thing that gets confusing is that if you introduce RxJS with HTTP client, yes. then people tend to think, oh, it's a server side thing. So we have a connection between the observable and the back end. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the decisions you make in how you're going to teach things can impact really the way the mindset people are going to get into and, and, and the way they understand things. So I, I like to start with the bare minimum from control. You subscribe to it, you receive an event. See, it's like an event listener, nothing that you don't already know about. You pass a callback, you receive the data nice and easy. Yeah. That's how I like to start. So people are not too scared. <laughs> nice. No, that's so perfect. And you're reminding me of a couple of teaching concepts. The first one is is, is exactly what you were saying, giving people that that example, mm -hmm. like a use case scenario. It's something that in education we would refer to it as modeling. You're mm -hmm. modeling for your students what something looks like at the end so that they know I'm taking all these steps and that's why, because I'm building that or I'm working yeah. towards that. And I think a lot of times in programming, people leave that out. They get so, you know, and, and it's so easy to do because you're so focused on just teaching the concept that you exactly. dig right into it and you forget to help people see visually what it is we're building. Yeah. So yeah, like totally agree with that. And then the other thing you said was, it was reminding me of something else I learned in grad school where they compared teaching kind of to a, a rubber band in a way where that rubber band starts really tight. You know, it's very elastic, very tight. And what you want to do with your students is put it around them so that there is some tension in that rubber band, mm -hmm. but if you, if you stretch it too much, too quickly, it will break. Yeah. And, and the idea is to stretch it a little bit here and then teach them something until they've gone a little bit more exactly. and a little bit more. And that is how teaching should be. And it's called the zone of proximal development. Okay. And it, it, it is so true though. You want people to not be overwhelmed, you want to just give them a little bit so that they're having to push, but not so much so. So like, I, I love everything you're saying. You've got it exactly right with a little bit at a time, let them build those muscles until they're ready for more, but don't exactly. go too much too fast. And and that's why the, the in-person training works so much better because mm. you can really see the people's reaction. You can see yes. if they're getting in or not, just, you know, visual expressions, the questions right. they're going to ask. You can see the struggle with exercises. If you do this at scale at a conference where you have 100 people in the room, right. you, you can't slow down or re-explain something. It's difficult to know how it's, it's going. It's difficult to get that feedback. Even yeah. online with, with COVID, I've been teaching a lot of sessions online. We kind of lose that feedback. It's very difficult for people to, to ask questions on Zoom and, and, and and yeah, getting that feedback from them is, is tricky. So I like the in-person training for that reason. I know I can be a lot better because I can read the people, even if they don't say anything, you, you can really tell if, if they're like, oh, wow, that's, that's scary. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or if they're going okay Absolutely. and we can move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, it, and that is another important concept, asking questions. It's But both ways. I think it's important for the instructor to ask questions of the students mm -hmm. because it makes them think about things rather than them just passively sitting and taking in information. When the teacher asks questions, it forces the student, even if in their own mind only, even if they don't answer it, they still have to think about, oh, what did he just ask me? What did she just ask? And so it's important for teachers to ask those questions, but alternatively, obviously for the student to then ask questions as well. So absolutely, I can see why in person would be more effective for for that 
if for nothing else. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, on, on Zoom, the other thing is people sometimes they do it from home. It can be that they have family members close by, so they can't really speak as easily as they would. Right. Well, it was mostly true during the the hard times of COVID, where everyone was working from home and kids were not in school and such. It's a little bit better now, but still, it it can be challenging. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. The distractions, but so all right, we've talked about the hard part, like the trickiest parts. But when you're creating a a program, probably either custom made for a particular client or just one of your online courses what have you found to be the best concepts to start with the things that really ease people into angular the best so i i like to i always start with components really okay. um and i show component libraries to people so i show angular material i show some of these libraries just so that they get the excitement of oh, wait, this is going to save us a lot of time because we don't have to reinvent everything. We can actually pick all of these pre-made components on the shelf and use them. So gets people excited, get them in the right mindset. They want to learn more and they, they can start seeing use cases where they're going to create their own components, share them with other people in the company. So it's all things that if they come from a full stack, you know, server side generated uh, stuff, didn't really happen at that with those technologies so yeah. yeah getting them excited getting them to to see components are very visual too right you can see right. it it's on the screen so it's a great way to get started always start with components that's that's really my thing and then we talk about directives and pipes still visual kind of thing and then only introduce dependency injection rxjs later on once all of the basics are in place Okay. So yeah. yeah, visual things first that they can retouch really and understand, and then getting in more depth in the more abstract or less obvious things. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have certain graphs and like charts that you like to use to help them conceptualize things? Um, I, I like to have a component tree, a visual okay. component tree, and when I teach uh, in person, have a whiteboard where I, I draw it. And okay. the the other thing that I like to do for people to be able to relate to what we're doing and make sure that they can see real life examples of uh, using Angular is that we, in my training, we build an app from scratch. Nice. So we start building an app, we add components to it, then we add directives, then we add pipes. And so by the end of the session, they have everything in that app. They have all Angular concepts and they can okay. see the roles that everything's gonna play. So as we add components to that app, I just add them to the component tree and I can say, hey, see, we're passing data from this one to this one using an input. We have a service over there that's injected in here and here. So it's very visual. They can really see okay. the app and have a, a mental representation of what it looks like. Nice. Okay. And then how do you know when they're ready to move on or not move on? Um, usually, I would say the questions that they ask is a very good indication. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I do a lot of exercises. So if they do the exercises super quickly, like I give them 15 minutes, but after 10 minutes, everyone is done. I know that we can move on to the next thing. On the yeah. other end, if I give it 15 minutes and at the end of the 15 minutes, I can tell that everybody's struggling. I know that we're going to spend more time and I'm going to re-explain things. Again, in person, perfect for this. Right. Uh, if you do video content or online, you know, webinar kind of thing, you, you cannot do that. So. Yeah, I, I really love in person for this for the, the ability to personalize and, and be at the right pace for everyone in the right. Room. So then for someone that's going through an online course, they obviously can't talk to an instructor all the time or ask those mm -hmm. questions. What are some things you would suggest to them so that they can kind of self regulate? You know, gee, I, I just went through this section on dependency injection. I just want to plow into the next one, but how can you help someone to know, no, like these are some signs that you should watch for to know that you're not ready for the next stuff or yes, you are ready. So I would say one of the, one of the ways to make an online course work better is to have your own little project that you're building aside from that course and try to use what you learn from it inside that project. Okay. 
which is tricky because you don't have any instructions to do so. Right. You don't have the guidance. Right. But if you figure out a way to use these concepts in your apps right away, it basically means that you you understood the thing and you're you're ready to move on. Whereas if you struggle and you don't see how you would use a service in your app and it doesn't seem to make sense, then probably you need more time to spend on this before you can really get yeah. the idea, use it in your app, which means, okay, now I got it, it works. And, and typically with coding, once you write your own code yourself using a concept, it's, it's almost 99% there, right? You, you, have, you have done something with it and you, you, you have the idea. So it, it's going to start sticking and, and you can expand yeah. the, the rubber band, as you say. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that kind of makes me wonder, though, because how do you spot a good course? Because the ones mm. from, from the sounds of it, and I would totally agree, the ones that are the best are the ones that give you an application to build or hands-on exercises of some kind, but you don't always know that before you purchase or go into it. How can someone spot this is good, this is not? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I would say, and it also depends of, of the person, right? True. At different points in your career, if you already know a little bit about the technology, you might be able to just watch a lecture on something and, and, and get 100% of it. Right. Whereas if it's something entirely new, you're going to need more assistance, you're going to need more practice and such. So yeah, making sure there are examples, lots of examples that you can relate to, that's, that's very important. Um, for instance, you know, we talked about RxJS. Yeah. 90% of the examples you'll find on RxJS out there, they're going to use observable off one, two, three, four, five, six. And people just don't relate to that. Right. <laughs> we don't play with one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> what is it? Is it data? Is it a number? Where does it come from? Yeah. You know, all of these, even if when you know what it does, it makes sense. But if you're com a complete beginner, it just doesn't help. Right. So making sure that the examples used by the instructor, they just click right away to, to you. So maybe watching a few minutes of the course, getting to a, an example or an illustration and see if the content works for you, if it clicks right away or not, that would be a good way to decide if, if you want to stick with it or, or find another one. Yeah. 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 It's hard. It really is. There's so many options and Oh yeah. I think even, you know, maybe an obvious answer too is just looking at the reviews and seeing how mm -hmm. many people are giving those positive reviews. But yeah, I, I totally echo what you're saying. I think if you can find courses that have those, projects to build not just here watch what i do and mm. watch me build something but where they're actually inviting you to go and build it along with them and you know pause here go do it on your own come back or here's the end of my video now go do it yourself those are the quality videos yeah, yeah, yeah. so and then along those lines like what are some good applications or projects that you would suggest for newer learners something you know, I think a lot of people always hear about the the to do app or something mm -hmm. like that. But do you suggest the to do app? Do you really think it's the best project, or <laughs> is there something better? So yeah, I, I don't do the to do app mostly because there was no back end involved. Most well, you could have a back end to do it. Um, I like one that I use in my training. If we do a five day training, the last day is going to be a project, one hundred percent, and we build a weather application. So you nice. we use an free API to get some weather data. You enter a zip code, you click a button and it's going to fetch a data, display it on the screen and you can track a bunch of different locations like this. Okay. Makes you use everything from Angular, components, services, HTTP clients, directives to repeat things, different pages as well. Like the details of the weather for a specific location would be a different page. So you do some router in here. You just touch on everything a little bit and and it's not too complex. So yeah. yeah, simple weather app, try to display the the forecast for a, a few locations. It's gonna make you cover pretty much everything. Yeah. Nice, yeah. It was actually one of my first interviews. I had never really done anything with an API before. Like it was a, a Star Wars API mm -hmm. and I had never really done anything with it. And boy, was that an early lesson for me. 
you know, make sure you've kind of learned at least a little bit of, of everything. But I like what you're saying. And I also would remind everybody what we had said before. We're just starting simple, right? Like exactly. just start with your component, then go to the next thing and go to the next. And before you know it, then you have your full weather app. But it can, it can sound overwhelming at first until you you really break it down. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. just starting simple. But do you have any particular study skills that either you yourself, you know, have found to be really useful or that you've found for clients, um, anybody you've worked with, students, just some people would say it is just getting your fingers on the keyboard and building things. Other people would say, well, but I really learn more with books, something mm -hmm. like that. But are there any study skills that you seem to find over and over and over that are really effective for most people? One of the things that really helps a lot is the motivation to mm -hmm. learn that technology in the first place. Okay. Meaning that if people are trying to learn this week because they know that next week they have to build something with Angular, they're going to be 99% involved in it, right? And right. they're going to be focused. Whereas if they attend a session because, well, you know, their manager asked them to do it and maybe they're going to use that next year or, you know, in, in the future, basically, right. they can't really relate to it. There's no time pressure makes things a lot more difficult. So just the motivation of knowing I'm going to use that right away. So I have to get into it. That can make a huge difference. And and so, yeah, if you give yourself a, a deadline or a project you absolutely want to work on, that, that's going to be very helpful. For me, when I started, it was my clients having, I had to do that work for them. So I had the incentive to learn and, and, right. and build these things. That, that was easy. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it, it does help a lot. The, the other thing we, we mentioned practicing and practicing if you don't have the the project idea or if you don't have the the course that gives you the the, the exercises, it can be a little bit tricky. So another thing that works, uh, I know it works very well for me, for instance, if it's an, an online course where someone is just coding and writing the code and testing it out, what you can do is do the same. So you just write the code as the person is doing it. Maybe slow down, go back if you if you don't have the time, just to test it out yourself. Okay. Because if you do that, most likely you'd want you'd want to test other things. Like, oh, what if I pass that parameter instead? And you start exploring a little bit. And by exploring, basically you're gonna learn other things around what is being taught, and you get to practice and get the confidence that you can code it yourself. Nice, so yeah. just repeating what the trainer is doing and coding the same thing, writing the same code. There's a repetition to it. Doesn't seem super interesting, but it, it helps. It really helps a lot. It does help with, you know, you memorize things easier if, right. if you type things too. Um, it makes you being active rather than passive. So it's, yes. it also gets you more involved. You have to listen and be in, into the what's going on on the screen. So yeah, these, all of these things help, I would say, to keep you engaged. And, and and yeah, if you're curious, you'd want to try other things with that code. And, and then that's how you, you kind of expand in, in different directions as well. Yeah. Now that is one advantage to online courses, I think, yeah. that you have compared to in-person because in-person has a, a schedule and, a, you know, its own, they have to <laughs> meet their own deadlines. So I think it helps to be online where you can take as much time as you want exploring and yeah, doing exactly. that practice. So. <laughs> There are advantages to online at times, agreed, but um, <laughs> you're, you, you made me think of another question though, and I don't think I've asked anybody else this because we often hear about pair programming, mm -hmm. but I think sometimes with pair programming, what ends up happening is that you, you end up having one person do more of the work than the other. Mm -hmm. And what I'm curious about, though, is if you've found that when you've been working with clients, do you like to have them have their own project? Or have you found that it's actually good in the beginning when they're just learning to have them maybe buddy up or work in a team of three where they're all working on one application together? Is that 
detrimental or is it helpful to their learning? It, it can be very helpful to, to have them work together, especially if, if there was a, a bigger group, like 15, 20 people, where, of course, as soon as you have a lot of people attending a training session, you're going to have different backgrounds. Some are going to be more advanced, some are going to be complete beginners. So what I found that worked very well in the past is having the more senior people sit in the middle of four or five beginners. So the beginners can ask them questions or okay. the senior person can really help them, you know, get them unstuck. It's a win-win for both parties because right. when you have to explain something to somebody else, you learn about it. You, you just, it, it, it becomes a lot more clear to yourself. Teaching yeah. is a great way to learn, which I know sounds weird, but if you do it, you just know that when you have to explain something, you have to understand it 100%. There's no other way around it. So, so yeah, pair programming or at least having one person help a small group and someone that, that doesn't usually teach is going to have to make the effort of explaining things and relating their own experience to the experience of the other person as well. Yeah. Uh, usually it's a win-win. Yeah, it, it can be very, very efficient. Yeah, okay. I love that. And you're right. Like turning around and teaching it to somebody else really does help. But it's exactly what we were saying, right? With that being able to ask questions, whether it's the person teaching, asking the students, how would you do this? What would be your next step? Or I'm stuck. How can you, you know, what can I do to get unstuck here? So both ways, I think it, it really does help. Um, what are some of the common mistakes that you see people making as they're setting out, like, as they're just starting to learn Angular, or maybe not, maybe it's, they've, already been in in it a little while what are some common mistakes that you see people making as they're learning angular in particular so one of the common mistakes is to try to do too much learn too many things at once okay uh, move on too quickly that that's definitely a big mistake that i see the yeah that, that would be really the, the the main thing trying to just go too fast, not spend the time to practice and, and work on the basics before they move on to other things. That, that's really what makes people say, oh, Angular is too difficult. If you take the time to do it at your own pace, I, I don't think you should hit that many hurdles with, with Angular. Yeah. Do you ever go back and have your students practice basic fundamentals? Like as you're teaching them Angular, do you go back and say, you know what, let's brush up on some JavaScript or basic HTML and CSS. Uh, yeah, we, I, I do that quite a bit because JavaScript, not so much because the thing with Angular is because it's a framework, it gives us so many tools. We can rely on TypeScript. So it, that, it's not that deep on JavaScript itself, I would say, compared to other, like React requires to really right. know JavaScript very well and relies on JavaScript a lot more than, than Angular. Um, but yeah, from time to time, we go back into JavaScript or basic TypeScript to just make sure people get to understand types and generics and those sort of things, because otherwise it, it, it makes everything more, more difficult to grasp for sure. Yeah. Okay. See, I, I, I'm a firm believer of that because I know when I was first getting into Angular, I focused so much on Angular that I was ignoring going back and really making sure that my fundamentals were strong and it came back to bite me pretty hardcore, you know, so that would be my, my suggestion of don't make that mistake of just yeah, yeah. making sure to keep, keep your, your learning well-rounded. Don't focus too much on one thing and try to build things together. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any last suggestions, tips, advice, like anything else you'd like to share with our viewers before we go, this has been fantastic. Such good advice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the other thing is that sometimes people ask me, as you mentioned, what course to, to go through and everything, but you could also learn Angular with read just the Angular website, right? It's all there. All of the topics are covered. There's information on, on everything. It might be a little bit steep at times, meaning sometimes it goes very deep, very quickly and, right. and, 
and, and, it, and it can be a little bit scary, but you could really learn on your own that way, own pace, own rules, and, and don't have to rely on other content. And for free as well, right? You don't right. have to, to buy a course or anything, uh, which is, which is uh, something pretty important to be aware of as well. Um, especially for people who like reading more, yeah. um, it's a great way to, to do it because books, books work, but Angular and the web is changing so fast that, you know, a book from two years ago is probably not that relevant today. Right. So right. the website is always up to date and you can read it. So it, it's a good compromise, I think. And I know that I like to learn a lot. I like to do that with Angular.io. I force myself to go through it at least once a year nice. and go through every single chapter and everything just to see if they, they started explaining something differently or took a different example, which sometimes I can get inspiration from when I teach or just to see if they sometimes they change the vocabulary a little bit around some things, right. which is also important to, to stay in sync with. So. Yeah, even if you know Angular, just going back to the website and reading those uh, those concepts just to make sure. Yeah, you basically learn some corners cases and other APIs by doing so, and and find new things. So it can be pretty good to to do that. Yeah, that can be everybody's New Year's resolution then. To go through <laughs> that once be, a yeah. year. <laughs> So there we go. There's our challenge to you. So okay, I actually do have one more question because you mentioned it can be scary. Mm -hmm. what do you do when you get to those moments where you look at something and you do get that like, Oh, like it's that sinking feeling of, I don't know what to do here. What, what are some things that you do to get through that? Um, yeah. So it, it, it could come from different places. The feeling it could come from the content itself. It could come from maybe it's not the right time for me to do this because I have time pressure to do something else. Like I'm not in the mood, there was something happened in my life and I cannot do that right now. In which case, the best thing to do is just to stop and say, I'll come back to this the next day. Yeah. Something I really learned from experience is that sometimes you're stuck on a problem and you spend hours on it and you don't know what to do. Right. You should just stop, sleep on it, come back the next day. 99% of the time, you're going to sit very clearly, right? From the floor. Yeah. And you'll be like, why didn't I get this <laughs> yesterday? It's just yeah. so easy. What, what, what was wrong with me yesterday? So just being able to stop and say, I'm going to try later. I'm going to take yeah. a break, maybe wait for the next day. It, it helps a lot. So pacing ourselves is, is key in many cases, I think. Nice. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. But as I said, all of this has been wonderful advice. I think you have really great insights. I loved so much of what you said, just pacing yourself, like everything. I, I couldn't agree with you more. So thank you. I can really tell you have an absolutely fantastic program. I think anybody that gets the privilege to work with you must come out so much better off. So that would be my plug, everybody. He has not asked me to say that, <laughs> but that would be my plug is if you can go you know, go through his courses on Angular training or even work with him, go for it. Uh, you can actually find him if you want to reach out to Elaine. Uh, it, his Twitter handle is Elaine Chotard. And I'm going to spell that because most of <laughs> yeah. us are not French, but it's A-L-A-I-N and then C-H-A-U-T-A-R-D. So that's Twitter. And then, of course, go to angulartraining.com. You can get all sorts of information on his, his programs and his consultation there. But yeah, thank you so much, Elaine. It was so much fun to talk to you. And hopefully we'll be able to do this again, dig dig more into like a particular topic or something. That'd be great. Sounds good. Be happy yeah. to do that. <laughs> all right. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>